a successful service which will enhance the experience for both uh, freight, uh, uh, freight users and for passengers to and from the Western Isles. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, with your permission, members will be interested to know that figures released today reveal that as of 10th March, over 98,000 16 and 17 year olds have registered to vote in the independence referendum. Yeah. That is some 80% of all 16 and 17 year olds, and there are still four months to go before the registration deadline. Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much for, for that information. Of course, I think we should all reflect today on all those young people who not only have a vote, but are currently sitting exams and wish them well with those exams. <clears throat> Presiding officer, according to Amnesty International, Vladimir Putin has effectively criminalised homosexuality, has cracked down on democratic dissent, carries out arbitrary arrests, and has corrupted the judicial process. And then there are many, the many journalists who have disappeared after criticising the Kremlin. Yet the First Minister has expressed his admiration for Putin. Will the First Minister now withdraw his ill-judged comments and apologise to the people of Scotland and the people of Ukraine? First Minister. No, but uh, I'll explain what my, my comments were. Uh, the first thing I said was I didn't approve of a range of Russian actions by which I meant not just their attitude to Ukraine, but also their attitude to human rights, particularly towards homosexuals. Uh, I said also that uh, I, I believed he'd been underestimated by the Western press. I, I think that's pretty obvious now. Uh, and I did express my admiration for certain aspects by which I had in mind the restoration of Russian pride, because I was speaking in the aftermath Order. of the Sochi Olympics. Indeed, I was speaking during the Paralympics. And why I believe our attitude to this is reasonable and consistent is that on the 9th of January, the External Affairs Secretary met the Russian Consul General to express our opposition to Russian policies on homosexuality. On the 13th of March, we expressed again to the Consul General our concern about Russian attitude to Ukraine. And on the 26th of March, we withdrew the invitation to the Consular Corps dinner an action that was widely reported, and we said we have taken this step following the Russian Federation's illegal and illegitimate referendum in the Crimea and the steps subsequently taken to annex the territory. So the Scottish Government and my position on these aspects have been totally consistent throughout. Strangely enough, I was searching today to find what Joanne Lamont had said about the situation in Ukraine. And I couldn't find a single comment, not just from Joanne Lamont, but from any of the opposition leaders this year. So I think on the explanation of the serious attitude we've taken to this serious subject, I think that is a, a reasonable perspective which reflects the views of the people of Scotland. Joanne Lamont. I think no matter how hard the First Minister Googles, he will not find me expressing any admiration yeah. for Vladimir Putin. <laughs> and on the question of Sochi, I think the protesters beaten with horsewhips at Sochi might have a different view of the success of the Sochi Olympics. Yeah. And it isn't, the First Minister says his position is reasonable and consistent. But to Amnesty International and others, it is something different. Michael Ostapko, who leads Scotland's Ukrainian population, has expressed that community's hurt, disgust, betrayal and astonishment at the First Minister's comments. He said in a letter to the First Minister, and I quote, We cannot see any good in Putin's actions, and we fail to see how you can be so effusive in admiration towards this despotic and criminally run nation whose own citizens are cowed into submission, not admiration, by arrests, assassination and rabid nationalism. Will the First Minister now withdraw his support of Vladimir Putin and apologise? 
uh, First just, Minister. Uh, just to be absolutely Order. clear, uh, when I uh, expressed the uh, restoration of Russian pride, I was referring to the Olympics and the Paralympics. We expressed our opposition to the attitude to homosexuality prior to the Olympics, but on a, a range of indications in organisational terms, the Olympics were widely regarded as a substantial uh, success in terms of their organisation. I've got a range of quotes here which indicate that. When I, I said I didn't approve of a range of Russian actions, I was reflecting a, a serious view put forward by the Scottish Government on a consistent basis. That is done before I gave that interview, since I gave that interview. That view has also been put forward to the Ukrainian authorities in several meetings on a consistent basis. Now, if we've done that, and I've explained the opposition that I have to a range of Russian actions and said how we've done that consistently, is that not a reasonable position to adopt? Yes. And why is it that only now Joanne Lamont has anything whatsoever to say about human rights in Russia or the situation of Ukraine. Only now does the Labour Party in Scotland Order. decide that this is something worth, worth raising. So I think the position we put forward is consistent, it's balanced, it shows that we don't approve of Russian actions, but makes comments which are reasonable in the circumstances. And we back that up by the action that we have taken. I don't think any of the opposition parties in this parliament can have any indication that they have expressed any concern in public that I can find. Well, if Joanne Lamont can point to a quotation where she was interested in this topic before today, then I'll be delighted to acknowledge she expressed such a quotation. I've pointed to the Scottish Government's Order. actions over a consistent period of time. I think it's reasonable to find out if the Labour Party in this Parliament had any similar record of action or concern. Joanne Lamont. I am a proud member of Amnesty International and I support what they have said on this question. And all of the human rights abuses that they have identified across the world. Because what the First Minister doesn't seem to understand that all of the things that his Scottish Government has said on this question are completely undermined by an assertion that the Sochi Olympics and what Putin has done there is worthy of any admiration whatsoever. Putin has annexed Crimea. Putin says acts like annex and Crimea have restored Russian pride. Alex Salmond has praised Putin for restoring Russian pride. Does the First Minister, even at this stage, not see his comments were at best ill-judged and must be withdrawn? What on earth does he admire so much about Putin? Well, if the First Minister bullies and threatens Scottish newspapers because he doesn't like their cartoons, maybe we can see what he admires about Putin. Even at this stage, will Alex Salmond now apologise for praising Vladimir Putin? No. First Minister. I'll state again the, the first thing I said in the interview, that I didn't approve of a range of Russian actions, and I've indicated how we've communicated that to the Consul General and publicised it, and indeed drawn the contrast on many occasions, which I have done, between the legitimate democratic process of a referendum in Scotland and the lack of constitutionality and the lack of process in the referendums arranged in the Crimea. I think that is a reasonable thing to do, backed up by action. But, you know, there are reasons, I think, to, to doubt uh, Joanne Lamont's and the other parties' bona fides in this. I've seen the letter. I've seen the letter. I, it's not just the absence of any comment, but I've actually seen the letter to the Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain, Scotland, signed by the three uh, Better Together uh, leaders. Nowhere in that letter is there any reference to Better Together's leading donor, that's the £500,000 donation from Ian Taylor, the boss of VTOL. Is Joanne Lamont aware that VTOL are engaged in a business relationship with Rosneft, including a loan of £10 billion, whose, whose boss, Igor Retsechi, is on... Order! 
It's Order. on the banned list Order. from the American government. So, will Joanne Lamont think about apologising to the people of the cocaine from that association? And furthermore, will there be any consideration to returning the Better Together donation of £500 to Mr Taylor? Joanne Lamont. Only, only in the SNP could that be regarded as an appropriate answer to a serious question. When the reputation of the people of Scotland is damaged by the performance of that First Minister. The First Minister, he wouldn't meet the Dalai Lama. But he praises Rupert Murdoch, he praises Nigel Farage and praises an ex-KGB officer accused of abusing his own citizens' human rights, all in the one interview, and then slags off Barack Obama. Alex Salmond, you should read the interview, Alex Salmond criticised Obama for not doing enough, but then said of Vladimir Putin, and I quote, he is more effective than most, and you can see why he carries support in Russia. He said he admires certain aspects of Putin's character. He said he's restored a substantial part of Russian pride, and that must be a good thing, regardless of the price that people in Russia have paid for that restoration. If, 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 as is evident now, the First Minister won't withdraw those remarks and apologise, will he now tell us, and the people of Scotland and people across the world, precisely what aspects of Vladimir Putin does he so admire? First Minister. Well, I did that uh, in answer to the first two questions, but can I just point out for the record there's a series of misquotations uh, yes. that Joanne Lamont yes. uh, engaged in. Well, Order. But to take, take but one example, uh, what I said was he was more effective than the press he gets, and that has been confirmed by the magazine. And what I have in mind is the Western press have consistently underestimated President Putin, and I would have think that would be pretty obvious uh, from the events of the last uh, few weeks. I have said, and let me say again, I don't approve of Russian actions across a range of issues. Consistently, this government has set out what these issues are, despite the silence from all of the opposition uh, parties on these issues. The Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain, President Zenko Lazaitsky, has written uh, saying, and looking at Sir Lord George Robertson's call last month yeah. for Russia to be admitted to NATO, yes. We cannot comment on his reasoning, but it's extremely bizarre while insulting to the Ukrainian nation. So can I say to Joanne Lamont that in that letter, which where I am sure she's going to explain why Better Together's biggest donor has business links with people on the banned list by the American government, she'll be apologising for the insult caused by her party colleague, Lord George Robertson. I think the serious issues are as follows. We have deprecated Russian actions and attitude towards Ukraine. We have spelt out and said that we don't support Russians' attitude to human rights or indeed to homosexuality. We've done these things consistently throughout this year. We didn't want to alight on the issue as part of a combined better together political opportunity. Yeah. We said these things before, during and after the interview with JQ, which is why we have substantially more credibility than the opposition parties in this chamber and why we'll continue to say them without fear and without favour. Question two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he will next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. Uh, no plans uh, near future. Ruth Davidson. Presiding Officer, the First Minister has said that he wants us to put his comments into context, so let's do that. On the same day that the First Minister sat down with Alistair Campbell, 10,000 Russian troops were massing on the Ukrainian border. Ukraine's Prime Minister said that Russia was demonstrating, and I quote, military aggression that had no reason and no grounds. Two days earlier, President Obama pledged to stand with the Ukraine. 24 hours after that, 
the German Chancellor Angela Merkel attacked Russian actions, warning the territorial integrity of Ukraine cannot be called into question. Then, on the 14th of March, the UK's Foreign Secretary, William Hague, called on the international community to take a united stand together to defend the territorial integrity of another nation. And that is the day that Alex Salmond used to praise Vladimir Putin, an act that he is still defending in this chamber today. The First Minister says that he wasn't wrong. But can he see why so many other people think that he was? First Minister. The, uh, I'll be writing to the Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain and the Scottish branch, uh, explaining the full range of the Scottish Government's action on the matter, making it clear that uh, through the meetings both with the Russian Consul General, through the meetings with the Ukrainian representatives and indeed the public statements that I and others have made, which have been substantially reported, how we made our attitude towards the Russian attitude to Ukraine absolutely clear, as well as expressing our concern with human rights in Russia, as indeed I did in terms of deprecating a range of Russian actions in the interview that she cites. Not only have I been unable to find any comment from Joanne Lamont on this issue, I've been unable to find any comment from Ruth Davidson on this issue. So Ruth Davidson also should have some understanding that when the Scottish Government has a substantial record of consistent comment on exactly these matters over the last few months, that stands in stark comparison with opposition parties which had nothing to say on this issue until they sense a political opportunity. Let me repeat for the record. We deprecate Russian actions in Ukraine. We are concerned for human rights, not just in Russia, but all over the planet. We have said these things consistently, and we shall continue to do so. Ruth Davidson. I think a substantial number of the people of Scotland would have preferred there was an absence of comment from the First Minister in admiration of Vladimir Putin. But, presiding officer, this is a question of judgment. The First Minister says that he backs our key British alliances across the world. He's shifted his tack to support NATO. He says he wants to show our closest allies in Europe and the US that he will stand alongside them. Yet at the same time, we see a leader who continues to make poorly timed, badly judged interventions on foreign affairs. The First Minister was wrong about Kosovo and he is wrong about Putin. We know what Amnesty International thinks. We know what the Ukrainian people in Scotland think. We know what other world leaders think. How can we trust the First Minister to represent Scotland on the global stage when he so consistently gets it wrong? First Minister. Well, that really was on the, the nub of the issue facing the people of Ukraine. Let's express again our concern for Russian actions in Ukraine, our concern for the Ukrainian people, our concern for human rights in Russia, the substance of the issue. I am interested, however, in when Vladimir Putin suddenly became persona non grata with the Conservative administration. Cameron's plea to Putin, help me stop Salmond was the interview yes. from earlier this year, repeated in this Parliament last month at committee, where a Scottish government, a Scottish official from the Scotland office, confirmed that they had discussed that report in a meeting where he was briefing the Russian government. Now, of course, perhaps he was just asking for information. He was doing things in a totally balanced way. But Ruth Davison will understand why, if in January you were appealing for Vladimir Putin's support, it comes ill to come to this chamber and tell us you'd condemned him throughout. Question number three, Will Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, the next meeting of the Cabinet will discuss issues of great importance to the people of Scotland. The First Minister isn't a homophobe, nor does he support the Syrian regime. But he must realise that if he praises people who do, he diminishes himself. He mentioned Sochi. The Prime Minister and leaders of the Western world spoke for us all when they boycotted Sochi because of Putin. But the First Minister praises Putin because of Sochi. 
considering the international storm, is he still adamant that he did the right thing? First Minister. I mean, there's a, a range of uh, acceptance from people internationally, including the American ambassador, including the Canadian Olympic president, that the Sochi Olympics were well organised and helped restore pride in terms of the people of Russia. They were generally, the IOC praised the excellent Sochi 2014 uh, game. So over across a range of international opinion, that was accepted. Why, why doesn't uh, the uh, Liberal Democrat leader accept that there is concern across this parliament for the issue of human rights, that the Scottish Government's record on human rights internationally has been described as exemplary, that we've worked with the Scottish Human Rights Commission on a wide range of civil society organisations to produce the first ever national action plan for human rights in Scotland, as well as recognising our responsibilities internationally. It would be wonderful if just occasionally Willie Rennie would accept that other people, apart from the Liberal Democrats, have expressed a consistent concern for human rights in our country and indeed across the planet. Will Rennie. He said that his remarks were balanced. Moscow didn't think so. President Putin lapped up the praise. I don't get why the First Minister's spokesman thinks earlier this week that it's OK to praise President Putin back in March. Putin hasn't just started persecuting gay people, restricting free speech, threatening to cut off Europe's gas supplies, backing the Syrian regime and invading his neighbours. He's been doing it for years. And it's not the first time for the First Minister either. Kowtowing to the Chinese over the Dalai Lama, on Kosovo and now on Russia. The First Minister wants us to stand tall in the world. But doesn't he just look small? First Minister. Well, uh, where do I start with uh, Willie Rennie? Uh, Willie Rennie hasn't. Order! Willie Rennie, like his two colleagues in Better Together, who have not mentioned any of them, the £500,000 donation from the man who has business links with people on the banned American list. Apart from that, Willie Rennie has never acknowledged and actually claimed, I think, that I hadn't raised human rights with the Chinese leadership. Can you please explain then this BBC report? That's uh, me and that's the Chinese leadership. And the headline is, Salmon Raises China's Human Rights. So I, I think I've got a track record yes. of raising human rights with countries across the world without fear or favour. In contrast, Willie Rennie rather like his two colleagues, also had said nothing about this issue that I can find on record until today. And it was, of course, his own party colleague when the Scotland office official was about to divulge to this Parliament's committee exactly what the briefing at the Russian Embassy was about earlier this year. It was the Secretary of State for Scotland who interrupted him and said that that information could not be disclosed. No doubt... There are limits to the Liberal Democrats' wish for freedom of expression and freedom of information. But when it comes to denying this Parliament's committee's information about what exactly was going to be briefed to the Russian Embassy, then I think at some point Willie Rennie might accept that he and his party have associations of which they should not be proud. And he and his party calling in aid Vladimir Putin earlier this year look a bit ridiculous, condemning him now when they've said nothing up until this moment. <laughs> Question four, Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what recent contact he has had with the UK Government regarding an independent Scotland's membership of the European Union. First Minister. Well, as is well known, the United Kingdom Government has repeatedly refused to jointly approach the European Commission with the precise legal scenario on Scottish independence. A point I made in correspondence with the Foreign Secretary on Sunday. He wrote me a letter and I replied that day. And hopefully that new intimate communication between ourselves and the UK Government will result in the UK Government changing its mind and jointly going to the European Commission with the precise legal scenario so as we can take these matters forward. Christina McKelvey. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer and note how well attended his speech at the College of Europe was this week, demonstrating the huge interest across, certainly what I'm seeing from the Committee of Europe in the debate over Scotland's Order. constitutional future. Can the First Minister outline what considerations has been given to the consequences 
of Scotland not being in the European Union, particularly for our friends and neighbours elsewhere in the EU? First Minister. Well, in, in contrast to the better together parties in this Parliament, there is a wide appreciation across Europe of Scotland's contribution uh, to the European Union. We may be 1% of the population of the European Union, but we are 60% of the oil resource, 25% of the renewable energy potential, uh, and 20% of the fishing stocks of the European Union. So this country may have 1% of the population, but has a substantial role to play in Europe, something that's appreciated by our friends and colleagues across the continent, sadly not in the Better Together Alliance. Joseph Ferguson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister's trip to Bruges, which Ms McKelvey has just referred to, has borne fruit somewhat earlier than he might have expected in that he now has advice that his government is perfectly entitled to implement a living wage through public sector contracts. So will he now instruct his members to back Scottish Labour's amendments to the procurement bill and acknowledge that the way is now clear to allow him to finally do the right thing for Scotland's workers? It's a bit wide of the mark, but First Minister... Well, uh, let's just uh, remember uh, that it's this government who introduced the living wage across the public sector in Scotland. Uh, the spokesperson of this presumably is the legal opinion uh, that, uh, that uh, the member is citing. Uh, and the Scotsman, they were not preventing it, but it was possible it could be challenged by companies at a later stage. Uh, this, of course, is exactly the issue that the European Commission has suggested that the Posting of Workers Directive in correspondence with the Scottish Government makes it incompatible for us to set a living wage higher than the winning wage. Well, I shall cite the correspondence which does that from the European uh, Commission uh, and put it in the record of, of this Parliament and will contrast it with the quote of the Scotsman which said it might be open to challenge by companies uh, at a, a later stage. This Government has introduced the living wage across the Scottish public sector, something that the Labour Party omitted or forgot to do. We are proud of that. This government is introducing the procurement legislation to encourage the living wage across Scottish society. This government is pressing the European Commission to make it unambiguous that the living wage can be part of the contract so that councils like Glasgow Council don't have to answer FOIs and admit that they share the same opinion as the Scottish Government as regards the European Commission. Can we not join together and say that Europe, if it's to be meaningful to the workers across the continent, should have a social purpose and the living wage is a grand example exactly of that progress? Question number five, Kezia Dovdale. To ask the First Minister, following the publication of the Morton Hall investigation, how the Scottish Government plans to support parents and families affected. First Minister. Well, I know the thoughts of all of us are with the families affected, eh, who have not only suffered the loss of a child, but the additional trauma that the Morton Hall report highlights. Uh, and that experience for families has been going on for decades. Uh, no one should ever have to experience this pain, and we're determined that no one shall ever will again. And that's why the outcome of Lord Bonamy's Infant Cremation Commission, whose findings, along with those of Dame Angelini, will lead to a new burials and cremation legislation. And it's order to, to stop these terrible events happening again in the future is a priority of this Parliament. Uh, but we must care for those who are affected in the here and now. Uh, we provided additional funding last year to assist the two counselling organisations who have done such sterling work and being closely involved with the parents affected by the issue. Today I can announce we're making available an additional £100,000 for counselling services for the families affected. As Scottish Government uh, officials have already begun discussions with the two counselling organisations to take this forward. Uh, can I assure Kezia Dugdale that the Scottish Government will implement the recommendations of uh, Ailish Angelini's report as regards the Government. Edinburgh Council have also made a similar commitment uh, and we will take forward Lord Bonamy's Infant Creation Commission and its recommendations into legislation at the earliest possible moment uh, so that these events never befall any family in Scotland again. 
can I thank the First Minister for that answer and welcome the additional funds. I know that the services that SANS and Simba offer parents are um, very, very important and make a real difference. Presiding officer, when you or I lose someone close to us, we have countless memories to call on, photographs and possessions. Parents who lose a baby have only those brief moments, and that's why the ashes matter so much. Parents at Morton Hall wanted the truth. Thanks to Elish Angelini's report, many now know with certainty that they will never know where their baby's ashes are. Will the First Minister promise parents beyond Morton Hall, those in Aberdeen, Falkirk and Glasgow and beyond, that his government will do everything in its power to access the same truth, no matter how hard it is to accept? First Minister. Yeah, yes, I can give that uh, commitment. Uh, uh, and I think that Kezia Dugdale is absolutely right that in this issue there are a number of key priorities. Uh, one is to find out exactly why over a period of many decades uh, this uh, process is at Morton Hall and perhaps elsewhere uh, were allowed to exist and continue in the, the way that they did. Uh, secondly, and I should say to the Chamber that the Lord Advocate has referred Elish Angelini's report to the uh, Police for further investigation. Uh, firstly, we've got to allow that investigation of any possible criminality to properly take uh, its course. But thirdly, uh, I think, and perhaps most importantly of all, and she refers to it, you know, having met uh, a number of the parents, uh, and I know ministers and other opposition members have as well, one of the key priorities uh, is to try and satisfy as far as it is possible, and Ailey Shangelina's report does indicate in some cases it will never be possible, that every possible investigation has been made into every individual case. And that is, I can assure the member, is absolutely predominant in the Scottish Government's consideration of how we proceed from here. I am aware that a number of uh, other members wish to ask questions on this very important issue. But there is a statement this afternoon, and you will have ample opportunity to ask whatever questions you wish to, and the, I will ensure that sufficient time is there that all of the issues in the report get a fair hearing. Uh, question number six, Liz Smith. To ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government is having with the Scottish Qualifications Agency regarding the future funding of the Curriculum for Excellence. Well, I, I'm sure, as we've heard already in this session, that the whole Chamber wishes luck to all of the young people taking the exams this year, uh, not least those who are sitting the Higher English exam as I speak and the Advanced Higher English this very afternoon. Uh, in recent uh, years, we've some, seen some excellent exam results. I'm sure that pupils' dedication and hard work and that of their teachers uh, will once again pay off. The Scottish Government is in regular discussion with all partners, including the SQA, on the implementation of the Curriculum for Excellence. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, First Minister, for that, and I'll add my uh, good wishes to the pupils. Um, the Herald newspaper reported earlier this week uh, that at a recent board meeting of SQA, there were warnings issued that the current position of financial deficit is likely to continue for the foreseeable future uh, because of the increasing costs of implementing the curriculum for excellence and the related support for teachers. Uh, teachers whose representatives told this parliament recently that when it comes to the new hire and the new advanced hire, some of the uh, preparations have barely begun. Could I ask the First Minister what is the revised estimate for the full cost of implementing curriculum for excellence, including for the new hire and the new advanced hire? First right, I've got a, a range of uh, calculations here following that report which show the income and expenditure balance of the Scottish Qualification Authority, uh, which I'm prepared to, to make available to, to the member. Can I, can I point out that each year the Scottish Government works closely with the SQA to ensure uh, that it reaches a balanced budget position and obviously the obligations of implementation of the Curriculum for Excellence are part of that budget consideration. Can I assure that that is being done, will be done, and I'll provide the range of figures which uh, give the detailed answer to our question. That ends First Minister's questions. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.
With guests leaving the gallery, please note that the, the Parliament is still in session and I ask you to do so quietly, please. The next item of business today is a Member's Business Debate on Motion No. 9251 in the name of George Adam on MS Week 2014. Treat me right. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on George Adam to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr Adam. Could we please have silence in the gallery? Mr Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Probably the noise in the gallery may be my own family. They're just getting overexcited at the thought of me debating here today. But uh, my own connection with MS, as most of you know, is through my wife, Stacey. Uh, Stacey. And as you can see in the gallery, she's up there. Obviously, it's almost like Romeo and Juliet at the moment with her there in the balcony. But, uh, and yes, we are just that romantic with one another. But Stacey was diagnosed at 16, and it was a life-changing uh, experience for her because no one knew about MS, GPs, the consultants, everything was quite difficult. Our family instantly went into a panic, uh, don't, didn't understand what it was. Our father actually just thought, oh, now we know it's MS. It was only when our mother explained to Tom that, uh, the life-changing aspect of it that he just broke down and understood. But Stacey went on to university and obviously eventually met the love of her life and uh, things got a lot better. But uh, Stacey is very positive uh, about our MS and how she goes on, as are just about everybody I know with multiple sclerosis. I don't think I've met one individual uh, with MS who actually sits there and complains or moans about the situation they're in. They want to actually be part of everything and get on with stuff. You know, I will actually apologise to some of my MSP colleagues that Stacey being the MS badge police uh, for the past week, where she's made sure that just about everyone has had to wear the MS Society badge. In fact, Rebecca Duff from uh, the MS Society Scotland said, I'm just glad she's on your side because she wouldn't like to be on the other side. But that's how passionate she is about making sure that we get the message out there. Because there are people who believe that you know, sometimes MS isn't as high up the agenda as what it should be. So here we are in year three of Stacey's annual MS Awareness Week debate. And uh, I was, we've been talking to many of the people at the event last night, who families that are dealing with MS. And we've also been t uh, talking to uh, my, our own family have come here. They almost treat this as a busman's holiday when they come down here to, over here to see this. And my mother-in-law has always got this thing where she says, you know, if someone stopped me in Paisley High Street about insert said subject, I would say this. Now that normally means I've got to listen at this stage as she's trying to influence my opinion on various things that are happening in the world. So she said a few of these things and when we were discussing it, you know, that is part of the fraud problem with families when they're dealing with MS. It's the shock, it's uh, feeling alone, it's the ignorance of actually knowing what MS is. I think things have changed quite a bit and things are moving forward, but that is still an issue for a lot of families as well. Since last year, things have moved forward quite a bit with us creating this, the cross-party group on multiple sclerosis. Uh, my vice convener, Lewis MacDonald, is here as well. We have created uh, an agenda that we make sure that we're focused on what we can achieve, just to make sure that we have a work programme that can deliver something, to ensure that we're not just sitting here talking about or moaning, effectively, every quarter about things not happening. And I think that's been because of the MS Society, the partner organisations, and some of the people involved in MS getting involved with the government, with the parliament, and actually saying, wanting to make a difference. And I think that's the, the big difference for us. You know, the, what, one of the things that Neil Finlay said to me yesterday is, and it's quite an important part, is uh, many families uh, of MSPs have a family member who have MS. And I think that just is an example of a representation of what we are dealing with here in Scotland. You know, the, one of the meetings we had with the CPG, uh, the first meeting, we actually started to talk about the big issue became access to medicines. And this is a big, big issue at the moment. The situation we have is we need the pharmaceutical companies, the Scottish Government partner organisations and the NHS to work together to deliver uh, access. Because last year's report that the MS Society did as a lottery in treatment of care actually mentioned that only 36% of people living in Scotland have access to the medicines that alter the course of MS. And 29% said they did not have enough information about 
the, uh, the medicines. And that brings me to the people and families that are dealing with it on a regular basis. The MS Society in Scotland decided that they would go out and gather some evidence to find out exactly what their membership and people in Scotland were doing with regards to MS. And they went to Inverness, Airdrie, Edinburgh, Hamilton, Aberdeenshire and Dunfermline. And they spoke to people. And uh, the big issue, again, was access to drugs, being able to actually get the drugs they need. There was one woman who said, I've been on, and excuse my pronunciation, uh, to Sabri for five years, and it's made a huge difference to me. Although the treatment clinic I go to is quite a distance away, I see my MS specialist regularly, but this is partly because the treatment I'm on and there may be side effects. Another woman said, when planning my life and business, I don't need to worry about fridges for my syringes because now I'm on uh, Jelenia, which is a tablet, and she just takes it in her handbag now. She's got access to uh, dedicated staff, but she worries about other individuals as well, whether they have that same access. I will mention a wee wifey from Paisley, who I uh, spoke to in the High Street, Rosemary Thompson, Stacey's mum, incidentally, and she said that she believes that more support to the person with MS is important at an early stage, more access to MS professionals, and GPs being better informed, because it's one of the issues that we constantly hear from people with MS, that GPs do not have the full information. Some of the support that is available through the therapy centres, like MS Revive in Glasgow, offer the best type of support, where a lot of the time it's actually just listening and talking to people, giving them opportunity to maybe get, give them the further information. But we've been quite lucky as well. Stacey actually had a problem with her mobility, and she only got physiotherapy after she had a fall. And then they taught her, after 20 years of having MS, how to walk with crutches. Now, after 20 years, Stacey now knows how to walk with a crutch. These are all things that should be happening at an earlier stage. We heard last night from Elizabeth Quigley how, uh, how she really wants to see things move forward with uh, access to drugs in particular. But it's a two-way street. We have to have the drugs companies actually making the applications to the SMC to ensure that we can actually get the drugs as well, because Vampira has had a licence to 2012, and Sativex has had a licence to 2011, but they haven't done anything with it at this stage. And we have to make sure that these drugs are available. Last week at the CPG, Stacey said, it's like someone saying to you, there's the keys of a new designer house, or there's a new designer house, and not giving you the keys. And you can just look at it for five or ten years. It can't make that difference in your life. And she also said at one point, that's evil not giving us the access to these drugs. And I think that's important because one of the other things we often talk about as well is the fact that MS in Scotland, we have more per head per population than anyone else. It's a very Scottish disease. We say there's 11,000 people uh, dealing with MS in Scotland, but the problem is we don't know for sure. And I would say, presiding officer, I would ask the Cabinet Secretary if he'd possibly look at uh, increasing the reporting for the Scottish MS register that was launched in 2010. Currently, it only registers people newly diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I think we need to expand that to ensure that we get people who have uh, everybody, everybody in throughout Scotland who has MS, because only then can we actually prescribe and treat people with MS when we know exactly where they are, exactly how many people there are, and that gives everyone the opportunity to do that. So, presiding officer, by starting to do all these things that I've said here today, I think only then we can start to treat people with MS right. Many thanks. Speeches of four minutes, please. I'd be grateful if members could stick to their time because the debate is heavily subscribed. Neil Finlay to be followed by Bob Doris. Thanks, President Officer, and can I apologise for having to leave uh, after my contribution. Um, I'd like to thank George Adam for putting down this motion for debate and for his work in getting the cross-party group and MS established and the MS Society for the very proactive work programme that they've put in place for that group. Um, I don't want to go over... Uh, the grim st st Scottish statistics on MS, uh, as this has been covered time and again when we debate this issue, uh, as we do annually. I want to focus on the impact of the illness and on the reality for sufferers. One of the things that concerns me most about the treatment of MS in Scotland is the unequal access to treatment. Only 36 per cent of sufferers with access to drugs that alter the course of MS, 25 per cent unable to see a neurologist when they need it. Six out of ten eligible people not taking disease-modifying drugs. Many struggling financially with care costs. Only a quarter in work. Many like 
my brother having recently had to stop work as he physically couldn't continue with it. Uh, unequal access to specialist nurses, to emotional support, physiotherapy, continence advisors. Um, last night, uh, I spoke to the only, the only MS social worker in Scotland, Dwayne Robertson, who works in Dundee. And of course, surprise, surprise, the poorest and most disadvantaged, suffering most and denied uh, access to the services. Uh, I had to watch recently a friend of mine who um, for several months experienced excruciating nerve pain that attacked his face, his mouth his, and his tongue, impacting on his ability to speak, destroying his quality of life, causing him to become housebound, lose weight and affect his social life. All the time he found himself left to his own devices with very little support and not wanting to ask for any. I also had to deal with a constituent with severe mobility problems who required a home visit from his dentist to carry out denture repair, yet no appointment could be made uh, for a whole month. Think about how that made him feel. Yet I hear of other areas where people have direct access to specialist nurses, phone numbers so they can contact someone directly for advice and support at any time, and access to other self uh, services to help them manage their condition. Um, last night and this week, the MS Society are highlighting the further inequality that there is in access to medicines for licensed drugs. And the Scottish Government often compares Scotland with other countries, but in this area, then I think we wouldn't be so keen to make that comparison. 25th out of 27 in Europe, with almost half the rate of access compared to Northern Ireland. And for people diagnosed, uh, they are supposed to see a specialist once every 12 months as a minimum. For many, this is still a very significant issue. And when they do see a specialist, the information on treatment, on new developments, as, as Elizabeth Quigley very eloquently uh, said last night, becomes a big secret. In my own area, we have an ability centre in uh, Livingston that has the uh, Krabis service. Uh, that's a West Lothian uh, Community Rehabilitation and Brain Injury Service. It provides community-based specialist assessment and rehabilitation for people over the age, age of 16 have either a physical disability or an acquired brain injury, and they include MS in their work. And they provide help with daily uh, living, mobility, communication, emotional support, social activity, and all the rest of it. But despite that being available locally in my community, GPs still do not refer people to it. Why is that? Why is something as simple as a referral to these support services not being made? Uh, my brother has never been referred to that service. The person I spoke about who had the excruciating nerve pain never been referred to that service. The minister made some very positive statements last night and they were very welcome. Uh, let's hope that those words result in action. But I think from all in the MS uh, uh, cross-party group, I'm sure we will be saying, Minister, we will be watching. Many thanks. And I now call on Bob Doris to be followed by Jackson Carlow. Uh, officer, um, can I start by thanking George Adam for, for bringing this, this member's debate before us this afternoon. Uh, I hope to make a, make a, a brief contribution. Um, my connection with MS is not a family member. I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that it's not a family member because so many people that I've met in, uh, over the years have had a family member who have had to uh, not just suffer with MS, but actually find a way of living positively with MS as well. And I think that's really important. And I want to talk about an organisation in my constituency called Revive MS, which George Adam referred to. I actually visited it because it was, it was down the road from my house and lots of my constituents worked there. So as an MSP, as you do, you go along. But I was absolutely blown away with what they do there. The first thing they told me is, uh, look, Bob, we're not here just to talk about what's wrong with people. We're here to uh, give them a place to hang out, to give them a place for family members and not just those who have the condition of MS. We're there to make sure whether you want aromatherapy or a massage or access to an MS specialist or whatever, a holistic approach to those living with and those who have relatives living with MS. And what they do is, is quite spectacular. Um, they do a series of outreach um, uh, services across the west of, of Scotland. The Cabinet Secretary will know have written to them recently about Revive MS, because such is their success, they've outgrown uh, their Maryhill base, and they're looking to, to co-locate 
beside uh, the Southern General Hospital. They're hoping to invest in and buy a property there, and they've started. I was at their, their launch fundraising dinner, where they're hoping to raise £850,000 to enable them to do that. And I know my colleague George Adams has already written to, to John Swinney in relation to how we can sustain such excellent third sector organisations. And I've written to, 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 to Mr Neil in relation to that as well. They tell me that they are confident they can get many trusts and charitable organisations to donate to that campaign to £850,000 to get this, this, this excellent new centre developed. But what they also tell me is any Scottish Government money, even a small amount of money, would be hugely powerful in leveraging in additional monies from elsewhere. Um, and I'll just leave it sitting at that, but I would not be, uh, I'd be doing a disservice to Revive MS and to my constituents if I didn't mention that during, during this debate. So I've done that now, Cabinet Secretary, and I hope you'll, you'll agree to meet with myself and, and George Adam in relation to work out how we can take that forward. The other thing I want to talk about is access to medicines and treatments as Deputy Convener of the Health and Sport Committee, I am incredibly proud of the, the cross-party approach we took to the access to, to new medicines in Scotland. Our committee got our teeth into that issue and it ceased to be a case of um, tabloid newspapers reporting which part of the UK could get one medicine, which part of the UK couldn't. We just looked at improving the subsystem to make it work for the people of Scotland. And that's kicking in now, and it will work for the people of Scotland. But I am concerned that there could be pharmaceutical companies out there who have life-enhancing drugs for those living with MS, and they're not making applications to the Scottish Medicines Consortium for whatever reason. And I know the SMC are, are world-class at doing scoping uh, scoping exercises to identify drugs that could be of benefit to the people of Scotland and encouraging people and companies to deliver the, the evidence to have it approved by the, the SMC. But I understand two companies specifically haven't done that. So just very specifically, Cabinet Secretary, anything you can do in relation to these companies and the SMC to bring forward these submissions, I would be very welcome as well, because I believe we now have a first-class system in Scotland, but it can only work if the pharmaceutical companies actually bring forward their medicines for consideration. So just two points, and I said it would be brief now over my time, so I apologise, Presiding Officer, but I hope you'll take these on board during your summing up. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Jackson Carlaw to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I too congratulate uh, George Adam on securing this debate? In fact, more than that, can I congratulate him, in fact, on becoming a champion for this issue in the Scottish Parliament? Because I think that by having a champion for issues like this, there is just that added dimension and impetus, which I hope will lead to the very progress that I think this debate is designed to achieve. Now, he began by saying that this was a Romeo and Juliet occasion with his wife Stacey perched on the balcony. So we will check the wall afterwards for messages of endearment having been posted. As is, as is the custom and habit. But I, I, I think the problem we have is that multiple sclerosis is a condition about which everyone is really aware. I think it's one of the conditions that most people on the street would say, oh, MS, yes, multiple sclerosis. But what I and others, I think, have perhaps totally underestimated or made unfounded assumptions about was the quality of the treatment that was available for people who suffered from multiple sclerosis. And I think that what is becoming apparent is that in a number of ways it is deficient, and certainly deficient beyond that that some lesser known conditions have actually managed to achieve by a focused uh, a promotion of the particular agenda underpinning that. The reality is depressingly and unacceptably different. It may be matched, and I was pleased to hear it, by the positivity of sufferers who are determined to make the very most and the best potential of the life they had. But actually, none of us can really be happy that Scotland languishes near next to the bottom in a league of international countries in terms of the treatment and the availability of treatment and the success of that treatment that we have. Now, there seem to be a number of issues at hand. Firstly, there is the poor dissemination of information about the disease and also the restricted quality of the service. And a number of members, George Adam went through the particular drugs in question, have cited the access uh, to medicines, especially the symptomatic medicines. The fact that we have a number of license, uh, medicines licensed which are not actually being prescribed, and we have a number of medicines that exist for which licenses are not actually being sought. 
And that is slightly unfortunate and ironic because, of course, so much of the focus when we have been talking about access to new medicines in the last three or four years has all been about cancer drugs, that we've to some extent undermined, under, undervalued and overlooked the fact that there are so many other conditions for which the access and the prescribing of medicines which can make a qualitative improvement now to a disease for which people have been seeking qualitative improvements for generations, um, and they're there, as was illustrated in the terms of the disease designer house, they are there but not being given access to those who need them. The second is access on a proactive basis to regular consultant services. That should be not something people uh, don't realise they are entitled to, but something to which they are routinely offered access, and I hope that is a, a, an improvement that we can see. I welcome the government announcement made last night about further enhancement to the services and offer, uh, but I think we should also be doing more to actually advertise, and I think the National Register would be a prerequisite of this, to all those who are sufferers, the various treatments that are available to what we imagine to be around 11,000 sufferers in Scotland. Now, I was at the committee that approved the establishment of the cross-party group on uh, multiple sclerosis, and I have to say, like many members, uh, I sometimes wonder whether we don't have just that many, too, too many uh, cross-party groups in this parliament. But what impressed those of us there at the time was the underlying commitment of George Adam to ensure that this cross-party group had a direct focus. And I think that direct focus is already producing an agenda that we hopefully can see translated into results. I'm sorry I was unable to be at the function last night. No slight was intended to that at all. I, like others, know people who have suffered or do suffer from the condition. It has my support. The focus on the Treat Me Right campaign will enjoy the support of this party. And I wish George Adam every success and the cross-party group in working with the Cabinet Secretary and the Government to make the progress we all wish to see. Many thanks. I now call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Jim Hume. Uh, presiding officer, I'd also like to congratulate George Adam on bringing forward this motion and, of course, for being, as Jackson Carlo said, a champion uh, of uh, MS uh, issues uh, in this uh, parliament. I myself certainly don't have any uh, great experience or, or expertise in this, although I am, like Bob Doris, very pleased to have a great voluntary sector uh, organisation, uh, the MS Therapy Centre, uh, based in my constituency, and, and thanks to all the members who supported uh, my motion on that recently, where I was praising their support services and innovative therapies that they uh, offer to people with MS uh, in Edinburgh and the Lothians uh, more uh, generally. And also, of course, I was praising the dedicated and diligent care of the centre staff and its uh, volunteers. So I think the voluntary sector is very important uh, to the whole issue of MS. And we've been very privileged this week to have the MS Society in the Parliament. Uh, we've been able to talk to them, but also read the various materials that they presented, in particular that they've been telling us about their campaign uh, called the Treat Me Right campaign. And I was very interested to read uh, the research that uh, lay behind that campaign, and then, of course, the particular recommendations, uh, or perhaps I should say demands, that the campaign uh, has been making. I thought two pieces of information from the research were particularly interesting. One, and I think this was a UK-wide, six out of ten people was relapsing MS uh, or not taking medicines that can alter uh, the course of the condition. And I suppose that probably corresponds to the 36 per cent uh, of people in Scotland who are getting uh, um, the, the drugs that would benefit them. But the other very interesting piece of uh, information from the research I found was that people uh, who feel both informed about the medicines and, crucially, who say they have regular access to an MS specialist are far more likely to be in treatment. And there was an astonishing contrast there between 69% of those people uh, and 7% of the other people. So those clearly, uh, that clearly highlighted a very important issue. And that led, of course, to the four uh, recommendations. Firstly, that all licensed treatments should be approved and available. And on this occasion, and this is great to know, it's not the SMC that's being criticised, uh, but in fact, uh, in some cases, the, uh, the pharmaceutical companies who've not uh, put forward uh, their drugs for uh, approval by uh, the SMC and in fact the SMP should be praised because they've actually approved uh, two new drugs uh, recently. But crucially they then uh, go on to, uh, to, to say that people with relapsing MF should be informed about the option and discuss with a specialist recommendation too which is related to the recommendation three that everyone should be invited to a regular review by an MHS specialist. So that really is a key issue I think Again, credit to the government for having the neurological standards, one of 
which is uh, invited uh, uh, to a review with the specialist every 12 months. But we know that that is not happening in every case. The 2012 um, health service, uh, neurological health service report said a quarter of people were not able to see a neurologist when they required. So that's clearly an area that needs uh, some attention. And uh, also, of course, a related recommendation is about access to a multidisciplinary team. And I think the, the nurse specialists for MS are particularly important in that regard. And again, about half the people affected have that access and half don't. So there is clearly more to do, but credit to the government for uh, having the standards uh, and, and the group that's now overseeing their implementation. Finally, though, I thought the last recommendation was equally important. All people with MS should be supported to be equal partners in decision-making about their treatment. And that's obviously an important general principle for the health service uh, linked to patient participations and the patient groups that support them. And I was interested talking to the MS Society today that they emphasised obviously not just the importance of their own organisation, but, but also of the Neurological Alliance of which they are a member, because they said many of the issues actually affected a whole range of neurological services. So it's clearly important also that the Neurological Alliance and the Neurological Voices campaign, which they have spawned, uh, the Neurological Voices Project, I should say, which they have spawned, should also uh, receive support from the Scottish Government. Many thanks. Just before I call Jim Hume, can I advise Parliament that due to the number of members who still wish to speak in the debate, I'm minded to accept a motion from George Adam under Rule 8.14.3 that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Mr Adam? Yes, proposed. Thank you very much. Um, that has been moved by Mr Adam and does Parliament agree? We do. I now call Jim Hume to be followed by Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too start by congratulating George Adam in securing this debate in this MS week and also congratulate him for taking as long as two minutes into his speech before he actually mentioned Paisley, which is a, a record long time, I think. But he did manage to get it in twice, so well done on that too. <laughs> it's true that Scotland has one of the highest incidences of MS in the world. Sadly, it remains unclear why that should be. Diet, genetics, environment or a combination might be the case. I speak in this debate this afternoon from a heartfelt perspective. At the end of the last session, there were concerns that Lucky MS Respite Centre in, in my region may close because of funding. The users and their families who needed the vital respite care it provides from across Scotland, North, North England and even People from the continent used it. They faced losing that invaluable service. Ian Gray, Jackie Bailey and myself all supported the campaign. Jackie Bailey hosted a members' debate on the issue. And I'm glad that the cross-party campaigning and support of the work of Mary O'Keefe and her team ended with Lukey House being saved to the benefit of people with MS and other conditions now. But MS sufferers don't just need respite, they need treatment. Concerns have been raised about the treatment of sufferers by different health boards. I share the view that health boards need to keep data as to treatments given by their various health professionals, time taken to treatment, and from that we can then see where we need to target improvements so that no MS sufferer in Scotland should be at a disadvantage to another just because of where they live. Once we have the data, we can then share the best practice across health board regions and look to improve the care for people with MS. If that doesn't work, then I think perhaps we should look at heat targets for treatments offered and waiting times to be treated. These ideas were discussed at the recently formed CPG on MS, which I'm glad to be a member of. Other concerns shared were follow-up doctor appointments after a patient is diagnosed with MS. I share that concern. During the cross-party group, we heard that often a doctor would diagnose someone with MS, but because the patient was at the very early stages of the conditions, no recommendation was made for any initial treatment. The patient could then go home, and because MS may slowly get worse, sometimes, several years down the line, the patient could have missed out on new treatments or early intervention. It's therefore vital, I think, that doctor practices have in place a best practice system which ensures that at a set time they invite the MS patient back in for a review to see if the condition has progressed or not. At the CPG, there was a frustration that many innovative new drugs were not available to them, but we heard from the industry that they had a due process and testing finished on them, a kind of chicken and egg situation, I suppose. And of course, we cannot freely license drugs without some due process, and there are some horror stories from the past when due pro process hadn't been enough. 
But what I would like to see is that people with MS, wherever they are in Scotland, are informed of all the options available to them, whether through drugs or therapy centres, like the excellent example mentioned by Malcolm Chisholm just a mile from here, in the form of the MS Therapy Centre Lothian, where Nancy Campbell and her team help people, uh, not just from the Lothians, but Fife and the Borders also use that uh, great centre. So we must ensure there isn't a postcode lottery. Diagnosis and treatment must be achieved timelessly with regular reviews of patient progress. So I look forward to working with the CPG on MFs and the Society on these matters in the future. And I look for assurances today from the Cabinet Secretary that this disease, given its prevalence in Scotland, will be treated with the urgency its sufferers deserve. Many thanks. And I now call Claire Adamson to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also congratulate George Adam and echo the people in the Chamber this afternoon who have complimented him on the work that he does, the work of the cross-party group, and indeed um, the excellent information that has been made available to us during MS Week this week, and indeed the very successful reception last night, which was excellently attended. I don't often speak in health debates. I'm not in the health committee and by no means an expert in that area. I'm lucky that throughout my working life, I have been able to seek expert advice from my big sister. So whether that was as an IT professional who worked in, in dealing with GT, GP um, systems and GP fund holding systems, or indeed in health related issues, um, I have always sought my big sister's support. My older sister Eileen has been a GP in England for over 30 years and is a fellow of the Royal College of GPs. She, as well as her GP duties, she also trains and examines GPs on behalf of the college. But in seeking her support today and her help for this debate, it was also her experience as an MS sufferer of over 30 years. And despite being part of the medical profession, and albeit an English patient, I think my sister's own experience echoes many of the testaments that have been given, brought forward by the MS Society that of um, a lack of coherence, no golden um, pathway through um, diagnosis and support for the disease. And um, because of the nature of the disease, seeing different consultants as the disease pro progresses makes it very difficult to build that rapport that would enable someone to discuss and, and talk through the, the options and possibilities moving forward with the disease. I was delighted to to learn so much at last night's event. Um, and I think um, in, in the debate this afternoon, many people have talked about the, the symptoms, and Neil Finlay made a, a very powerful um, speech about the symptoms of MS sufferers. But I think we should also highlight today to people um, who maybe don't understand the disease as much as those who, who live with it and, the, and their families and, and friends and carers, in that these are extremely powerful drugs. And we maybe don't talk about the effects that the treatment itself can have on MS sufferers. When we talk about disease-modifying drugs, um, it wasn't until my sister described her treatment as chemotherapy. It struck me because chemotherapy brings that home to us uh, because it's normally associated with cancer treatment, how um, powerful a, a, a drug it can be. And um, in my own sister's case, and for many, many sufferers, I think the choice um, that they have to make every single day to take a treatment that they know will make them feel awful for, in the short term for what may be a not a guaranteed long time gain. So I was particularly interested last night to learn about the tablet forms of um, DMD, um, DMDs because I had, had not realised um, because my, my own sister's experience has been uh, on injections and all the associated problems mentioned about needing fridges and travel and all these things that um, you know we, we maybe don't understand um, as, as part of the disease. So um, my sister um, spoke, she, she's very lucky, she's still working and she was attending a Pilates class the other day for people with various types of um, uh, diseases that um, benefit from, from um, sort of this type of um, therapy and she asked them about what, what they would want me to say today about what the experience they have of being, being um, sufferers and um, it, it was all about getting everything right. It's not just about the medicine, it's about all the support services as discussed by other people today and, and really that um, 
confidence to know that they're making the right decisions themselves in conjunction with their medical practitioners about the options going forward. So I think the Treat Me Right campaign is fantastic and will take this whole debate forward. And I thank everyone who's been involved in this process for this week and, and look forward to the Cabinet Secretary's response. Many thanks. And I now call John Finney to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I too would like to congratulate George Adam, thank him for his work throughout the year, likewise the MS Society and the, the various uh, MS therapy centres and other treatment centres around the country. I want to give a particular example about a constituent, I hopefully I'm going to say nothing would remotely identify the individual, but I think it graphically illustrates um, some of the issues. It was in May of uh, last year, approached by a young woman, the mother of a, a preschool, uh, preschool child, she had been prescribed fampredine by a neurologist. Um, she suffers a lack of mobility, and this was a drug that would help with uh, walking speed. The pharmacy had refused the medication, the medication but uh, she was told that she would be able to uh, self-fund at the cost of £250 per month. Now, she was aware that this particular drug didn't have SMC approval, um, and as has been said of others, like many MS sufferers, was very well informed. And at that stage, she was currently appealing. And the notes that uh, Linda, who works in my office, had was uh, upset, knows the drug may not necessarily make her quality of life better, but feels she should be given a chance. So at that point, the treat me right, I think, would be highly appropriate. By the end of June, the appeal's still not gone through, but the young woman had started and was got in touch to tell me that she was in the third week or four weeks of a trial. Cabinet Secretary alludes to this in a letter, a subsequent item, and quite rightly it says that that was a private arrangement. Um, she, she says, I have really positive results. This is great. I'm preparing myself for having to not take it as I can't afford it, and until pharmacy approves funding, I'll not be able to stay on it. She's offered face-to-face um, -face meetings with various people, uh, um, but declines this, uh, asking for information in writing, because she doesn't have the necessary mobility to get there. I wrote a letter supporting the, the appeal suggesting that wider uh, aspects should be considered, and I'll come on to them later. Uh, and uh, on the 16th of August, the appeal fails. Um, further representations are made. Uh, I write to the um, Individual Patient Treatment Request Coordinator about procedural issues. I write to the Cabinet Secretary about some general questions about drugs and treatment, and, and, and I get a, a very comprehensive response. I write to the company, Biogen, uh, who tell me they hope to have data which will be available at some point in the future, and I'd be very keen to get the paperwork in for that particular drug. Um, but moving on and missing out a lot of trauma in between, on the 19th of uh, December, I, I get a lovely email that says, last night's the first good night's sleep I've had in months. Great news to have before Christmas and New Year. Now, these are months of anguish, and... Uh, the, the private arrangements called the Responder identification, identification Scheme, and I don't think people are interested in what it's called. It might be considered a, a prescription. I think there's a lot of uh, phrases, buzzwords, that, that we use a lot in this chamber here. Gerfic, um, we talk about the integration of health and social care. We talk about holistic approaches. And I think, I'm not for one minute suggesting, in fact, quite the reverse, that this uh, young woman's child was brilliantly looked after and two loving parents, but it can have an impact. The prescribing of the drugs has a positive impact, not only in the child, but also uh, and, and the rest of the family. Um, we also talk about preventative spend and looked in the broadest sense uh, that that's terribly important. Prescriptions have been referred to in this chamber, and I agree with the term as a, as a, a tax on the sick. Um, and I think, as I've said, in the finer points of debate, people aren't really bothered about procedures. They want to be treated properly. L like many others, I took a lot of reassurance from what the minister said last night. At the reception last night was Dr Michael Foxley, a former council colleague who's, who's very involved. And he echoed what a lot of people said, and that is that MS sufferers have a lot of positive uh, attitude. Um, I think with the positive attitude we heard from the Minister last night, there is progress going forward. I can tell you that the, the, the woman continues to do very well, and I hope that's an example that can be followed um, elsewhere. So thanks again to George for bringing the debate. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by James Dornan. Thank you very much, and I too congratulate George Adam for bringing this debate and for his proactive role in setting up our cross-party group. Multiple sclerosis impacts on thousands of people across Scotland, but nowhere more so than in the North East and the Northern Isles. The proportion of people in Aberdeen with MS is 20% above the Scottish average. 
the proportion in Orkney uh, is more than double. And Grampian sharing some health services with Orkney and Shetland has a particular responsibility to give a lead in the support of people uh, with MS. And in many ways, NHS Grampian does that job well. Marshall e. Craig, who is a trustee of the MS Society and who was at the reception here yesterday evening, often says that if you're going to have MS, Aberdeen is not a bad place to have it. That says quite a lot about the positive attitude of Marshall and indeed of many other people with MS, as we have heard. But it also reflects the good access to services and the excellent support from staff, uh, which is the experience of many in Grampian. Critical to that is the continuing provision of good quality neurological services at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, something which must not be compromised by any temptation to centralise services towards the central belt. Critical also is the outstanding service provided by MS nurses in Grampian. Any temptation to cut costs here would immediately be self-defeating because the support of MS nurses is not only clinical good practice, uh, it's also cost-effective uh, in the work it does in reducing the need for hospital admissions. The Horizons Rehabilitation Centre in Aberdeen provides a very valuable service for people with a range of neurological conditions, uh, though only for those recovering from relapses. Increasing access to those services would actually be, again, cost-effective, uh, as good physiotherapy support can help people to maintain mobility and to manage their symptoms. And, and, and of course, the Stewart Resource Centre, funded by the MS Society itself in Aberdeen, is also invaluable in the support it provides and, and deserves their continuing support. So Aberdeen is not a bad place to have MS in some respects, but not in all. It is true that NHS Grampian was ahead of the game in prescribing beta interferon for MS patients from an early stage, but more recently, access to treatments has been less readily available. Anne Ferguson from Tuch in Aberdeenshire can vouch for that. Her consultant at ARI recommended five years ago uh, that she should have access to the drug Sativex uh, to deal with the involuntary spasms, which for her are the most significant symptom of her MS. In the absence of approval by the Scottish Medicines Consortium, an individual patient treatment request was made to NHS Grampian on her behalf. It was refused, an appeal was lodged, that too was unsuccessful. And three years ago, Anne's GP wrote her a private prescription for Sativex, but again, NHS Grampian instructed him uh, that it was not uh, suitable for prescribing uh, within their area. And a constituent told me yesterday of similar difficulty in obtaining a prescription for Fampredine, either in Aberdeen or in Glasgow, even though he is himself a health service professional and was willing to pay for it himself. These, acts, these issues of access to treatment are not local, uh, they are national. And as we have heard, people with MS have better access in all but two of the other member states of the European Union. And ultimately, these issues of access are for ministers to resolve. That's why it was good to hear Michael Matheson yesterday evening make a pledge on the record to say that people with MS should receive the right treatment at the right time. That will require early and positive actions by the manufacturers and early and positive decisions by the SMC which is, of course, ultimately the responsibility of ministers. So my constituents and thousands of others will look to all concerned for rapid progress on these issues, as will members across this chamber. And I look forward to hearing from the Cabinet Secretary just how he intends that his government will carry out the promise uh, which they gave us uh, last night. Thank you. Many thanks. And our final open debate speaker is James Dornan. Thank you very much, President Officer. And like everybody else in the Chamber, I'd like to thank George and Stacey for, for bringing this debate to the Chamber today. Uh, it's been a very informative week. The stall uh, and the event last night taught me a lot of things I didn't know about MS before. And for that, I thank everybody involved. My, my colleague Bob Doris has already described in great detail a lot about the work that Revive MS do, so I won't dwell too much on that. However, just to say that I've been fortunate to see some of the work that the local branch does in my own constituency, where they meet in Cathcart Trinity Church every Friday. I know that the local Revive Group is a lifeline for many people with MS across the south of the city, and I was reminded of this a few months ago when I met an old friend of mine. I hadn't seen him for ages. He looked great, still fit and healthy. And that's what I'd have expected. This guy was a great footballer, and I mean great, classy, energetic, and played well in his 30s and I believe in his 40s. So you can imagine my surprise when he told me that he'd heard of my visit his organisation as he'd suffered from MS and was a member. This just brought home to me how little I really knew about MS, who it affects, why it affects them, and what we can do to make life easier for those who suffer from it. 
Now, the access to drugs and other matters have been dealt with by others, so I don't want to deal with that, and I know it's getting on. So. But colleagues across the Chamber might remember that last September I held a members' debate on a report by Independent Living in Scotland on widening access to politics. During this debate, I spoke of my desire for the Parliament to implement some kind of programme for people with disabilities. I wrote to the presiding officer, and out of the support and guidance I received from her, we have managed to bring about a parliamentary internship programme for people with disabilities, funded by the Scottish Government through SEVO Inclusion Scotland, and ably supported in Parliament by our fantastic equalities team. And that's important because when I suggested the idea of an internship, it was because I firmly believe that we make better decisions as a parliament if we have many voices and experiences articulated both in the chamber and through the people that we meet in our role as MSPs. Inclusion Scotland have secured funding from the Scottish Government for another six interns over the course of the next 10 to 12 months. And we're having an event in parliament at the end of this month to discuss the internship and how members can get involved. I'll discuss this in greater detail then. But I'm sure there will be plenty of interest from my colleagues across the chamber in participating in this internship programme. And I bring this up because the first intern for the programme, Katrina Johnson, has recently been appointed and will begin in my office in the next couple of weeks. Katrina had to go through a rigorous selection process against some very formidable candidates, and she won through because she deserved to. Katrina's MS. Many of you will have met her. She's been one of the people in the MS stall in the garden lobby this week and was at the event last night. I have now had the good fortune to meet, meet up with her on a few occasions, and it is clear that Katrina, like so many others suffering from MS, will not be defined or curtailed in her ambitions by her condition. I have no doubt that she will bring a great deal to my office and be a great role model for those interns who will follow in her footsteps. We are both looking forward to this internship starting for Katrina to get a sense about what Parliament is like, and for me to try to grasp some of the everyday problems somebody with MS may well have to deal with. One of the important roles in this programme is for interns to undertake a project, and I'm going to discuss with Katrina the idea of looking into in greater detail the reason why manufacturers are reluctant to put the drugs out to review by the SMC, and what impact decisions like this have on those suffering from the affected condition. We'll pass the information on to yourself, Cabinet Secretary, when we're done. Signing officer, I fully support the aims of the Treat Me Right campaign, and it's clear that there is broad support across the Chamber to move forward with this to try and get the answers to ensure that folk with MS across the country are afforded the quality of and access to care that they fully deserve. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now invite Alex Neil to respond to the debate. Cabinet Secretary, in the round seven minutes, please. Thank you very much indeed, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, James Dorman thanked uh, George and Stacey. I would like to thank Stacey and George. Uh, because Stacey's influence in this, uh, I think, is well known, and uh, I think this debate is very appropriate. And although, unfortunately, I could make the reception last night because I was travelling back from Brussels, uh, I do believe that it was a very successful event. I would also like to congratulate the MS Society. I think that deserves enormous credit for the contribution it makes to improving the lives of people with MS, and they continue to play a vital role in promoting new research and in raising awareness of the condition. I will try throughout my speech to answer some of the very specific points made, and I'll begin by, first of all, saying to Jim Hume, we have provided now three-year funding for Lucky House, which I'm sure he will welcome. Uh, and also, although he's uh, no longer uh, here, Bob Doris, to confirm that either Michael Matheson or myself would be happy to meet uh, with um, the uh, Revive MS group. I met with them last year and uh, we supported them with just over £21,000 worth of funding. So uh, more than happy to meet with them uh, again. Uh, either Michael or I will do that. Uh, when it comes to medicines in the register, I will try to answer those points as I get through my notes. I think very clearly the access to treatment is a, a major issue that's been highlighted today, and the MS Society's Treat Me Right campaign uh, for appropriate treatments is particularly important. And of course, they emphasise the need for disease-modifying drugs for people with relapsing and remitting MS, which can help manage relapses and the impact of these relapses. Symptom management treatments for people with either relapsing or progressive MS, which can help manage some of the symptoms of MS, including specificity, walking speed and incontinence. And we want to see engagement by the pharmaceutical industry with the Scottish Medicines Consortium. And can I just make two points here? Uh, first of all, I am happy to take the initiative uh, in contacting the companies who have yet to apply to SMC 
see for acceptability of licensed products. I do accept the general principles that our objective should be to have all licensed products available uh, to MS sufferers through the SMC process. Uh, so I would like to emphasise that. Uh, secondly, I would make the point, particularly to Lewis uh, and his contribution, that hopefully as a result of the recent reforms introduced into the SMC process, including the replacement of the IPTR process by the PAC process, that we will see significant improvements in terms of reducing any and eliminating any postcode lottery in terms of the availability of these drugs. As Jackson Carlo said, although much of that, those changes were motivated by cancer-related drugs, we are very conscious that the changes relate to MS and indeed a whole host of other uh, ailments, including cystic fibrosis. So let me underline our commitment to deal with that situation. Cabinet Secretary, could I stop you just for a moment? Sorry to interrupt. It's just that you, you have referred to a number of members just by their first names. And whilst we would be aware of who Michael, for example, right. would be Michael Matheson, MSP, perhaps for the record, we could, and also for those watching the proceedings, we could just clarify yeah. by referring to members by their full names. Lewis Thank is you. Lewis MacDonald and Jackson is Jackson Carlo. Uh, with regard to access to specialists as a government, we recognise the vital importance of seeing the right person at the right time in the right place. And I had the pleasure recently, or Michael had, of, re, of speaking at the National Neurological Advisory Group Learning and Sharing event. Uh, and that group was formed to take forward work to ensure continued improvements in neurological care, including for those living with MS. Access to specialists in an area that has been recognised by them as a continuing priority, and they're taking forward work in this area. And can I say, as part of the announcement uh, Michael Matheson made last night, I am very keen that we tackle the issue of variation between different health board areas in terms of access to treatment and access to the necessary resources. We last week published uh, an audit of chronic pain services right across Scotland, looking at the variation between different board areas. I am keen that we do the same with MS with a view to eliminating those variations so that everybody gets first-class treatment irrespective of where they live in Scotland. I think that's extremely important. Uh, and it's also important, obviously, that we've got the right skill mix, the right number of people in the right place at the right time, and obviously, uh, we, we are very keen to ensure, particularly in terms of neurological resources, that that's the case. There will be six trainee neurologist posts advertised in the 2014 recruitment round, uh, which will be filled via national recruitment. And that will be a further enhancement in terms of the neurological resource available for patients. In terms of access to information, the Treat Me Right campaign also quite rightly highlights the essential need for people with MS to receive the advice and information they need in order to make informed decisions about their care and treatment. Again, the National Advisory Group are well placed to identify and address any gaps in the provision of information that supports people to make these decisions. Also ensuring that clinicians across Scotland consistently provide high quality information that can support not only decisions about treatment, but also support people to self-manage their condition. And this will be taken forward through the work in care pathways and patient experience. I'm pleased to hear that the MS Society is an integral member of the advisory group uh, and through the group well positioned to help shape the delivery of neurological services. Let me come now to the MS Register. As a government, we recognise that data is an essential element to delivering improvement. Uh, we have provided funding of £70,000 to support the establishment of the Scottish MS Register, which commenced work at the beginning of 2010. The register was set up to gather reliable data which would establish the incidence of MS in Scotland. The MS Society has also provided funding to support the register and has been involved in, in it since its inception to ensure that it has people with MS as its focus. The register is hosted by NHS National Services Information Services Division, ISD, and in 2013 it published its first national report. 
they have provided assurance that MS clinical, the MS clinical community is fully engaged in the register. SMR01 data is being used to measure data completeness and potentially identify patients who have not been reported to the register. The data collected is used to produce quality feedback reports which are provided to MS teams and they include all known patients given a confirmed diagnosis of MS in the last 12 months. However, I do agree with the point made by George Adam in his speech that we should look to expanding the register eventually to include every MS sufferer in Scotland and I undertake to take forward that specific action point as well as the others I've mentioned from the debate today uh, because I'm very, very conscious of the benefits of comprehensive registers in taking forward treatment and indeed the research for finding cures for conditions like MS. The register also monitors the referral process from time of diagnosis to contact with an MS nurse and boards can use the report to assess which stage in the referral process needs to be improved. So in terms of all of these areas, Deputy Presiding Officer, I do believe we are making substantial progress, but there is further substantial progress to be made. But let me underline, and I think this is right across all the parties in this chamber, I think we're all at one in this, in recognising that Scotland, unfortunately, is the world capital for MS in terms of its incidence. I think there's therefore a particular onus on all of us to do whatever we can uh, to make uh, life as comfortable as possible and as easy as possible and as high quality as possible for sufferers. But obviously, the ultimate goal must be to find a cure. Thank you. Many thanks, Cabinet Secretary. And for the record, could I just inform Parliament that Bob Doris did apologise to myself and the Chamber for having to leave early. That concludes George Adams' debate, MS Week 2014, Treat Me Right. And I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30pm. <laughs>